Hello, I'm Richard Clearwell. Welcome back to another episode of Litigation Speaks. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some fraudulent activity and how this impacts a fraud investigation and it also impacts a business valuation that you're doing. In the world of corporate finance, maintaining trust and integrity is paramount. We have to have that trust in the financial statements. This is not just a matter of compliance, it's the foundation for investors, stakeholders, and the entire community that's relying upon the financial statements that are being generated. However, there are times when individuals will bypass all the securities that we set up, those are called internal controls, they'll bypass those internal controls and do their own thing uh, and create fraud. Technically, I can't testify that something is fraud, but if it looks like fraud, smells like fraud, quacks like fraud, it's gonna be fraud. So that, that's kind of how I approach that. But people will do that. There are a number of deceptive techniques that people will use. And again, this impacts the financial statements, whether we're doing a forensic engagement or if we're doing a business valuation. The one I wanna talk about is dealing with inventory and cost of goods sold. There's a direct relationship between those two. If someone is buying product that is for a separate company and putting it into a, a master company, a parent company, then those cost of goods sold are going to increase the cost of goods sold in the parent company and decrease it in the other companies. It's also going to increase the inventory that we're going to have in the, in the master company and decrease the inventory we're going to have in these subsidiaries or affiliated companies. So what winds up happening is now we have financial statements that are not correct. We have an overstated inventory. We have an understated cost of goods sold. That makes the balance sheet look a lot better than what it is. It makes the income statement look a lot worse than what it is. So now, if I'm in a shareholder dispute and I don't want to pay as much out for the shareholder dispute, or if I'm going for a divorce, through a divorce, I'm sorry, and I don't want to give anything to my wife, this is an easy way to manipulate the financial data. It's not that difficult to find if you know what you're looking for. So this is done, and I hate to say it on a regular basis, but it's, it's not that infrequent that these sorts of things will happen. When that happens, what we have are a lot of times, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're, they're just inflated levels. Inflated is the word I'm looking for. So, so now we have an inflated inventory and we have a deflated cost of goods sold. And what that does is it creates problems because when we see this, which brings up a good question, how do you see it? If you're an attorney, it's real easy to find. Okay, what's well, the, the theft is not easy to find, but the, the red flag is easy to find. What you have is a secretary that works for you that probably knows a whole lot more about Excel than you know. I.e., I've got people that work for me, I have no clue what they're doing. But they do a good job at what they're doing, I don't understand it. But that's okay, I don't need to understand it. You can have somebody there that understands Excel. Let's say you have five years of financial statements or, or tax returns. I like to work off of tax returns because those are signed under penalty of perjury, which to me gives me more strength to rely upon those. Have them put in the sales for each of the five years we assume we're gonna have. Have them put in the cost of goods sold for each of the five years. Then what you wanna do is go out to Excel and do an insert and select a line chart. When you look at the sales and you look at the cost of goods sold, there should be a real good correlation between those two. So if there's an anomaly where the cost of goods sales jumps up or jumps down, there's a red flag and that area should be investigated to see if there's any fraud uh, going on with that. 
if there is fraud, that's going to affect a number of people. It's going to affect lenders that we have that are out there. It's going to affect our shareholders that we have. Any uh, information that we've relied upon because of this is going to be relying upon faulty data. If we file tax returns based upon these costs of goods sold in inventory, <clears throat> now we have tax fraud. The bank wants a copy of it, so we give it to the bank. Now we've got bank fraud. Depending on how it's given to them, if we put it in the mail, then we've got mail fraud. If instead we decide we'll just drop them an email real quick on this thing, well, now we've got, I believe, wire fraud. Uh, we've got inventory fraud, we got document forgery, and we have collusion. So it just scatters all over the place with all the implications of doing this. <clears throat> so it's important to have good internal controls and have somebody watching over what's going on. This gets more difficult for smaller companies because what we want are separate individuals doing different things. So what we need to have are the internal controls in place where we have an individual that's responsible for one section of a, of a, a task, somebody else has a different section of a task, similar task, and another person would have another responsibility for that task. So not one person is doing everything, and that allows for controls over what is going on. So those, in, those controls are important. Now, here's something to think about for, from a control standpoint, and if you need any help with this, we can help you with the internal controls. We recently finished an engagement and the company had internal controls. And what the internal controls had was one of two items. We have policies. The policies say, this is what we're gonna do. Then we have procedures. Then we have the detail of what we're gonna do. This particular company had the policies. We're gonna do this. And the policies were good policies. But when you get to the implementation, how are we going to do this? How are we going to have the separation of duties? How are we going to do these various functions? There was no information provided in, the, in their internal controls on how that works. And the company's assistant that they have internal controls, and I'm telling them, not really. Uh, but but that's it's, it's their company. They can do what they want to do with it. But that is something to think about. Uh, that those sorts of items should be done and are not that difficult to do. So if you have a problem with internal controls, if you go back and again, do that little chart I just mentioned a while ago, do that, see if those coincide, it's called correlation, do they have a high relationship with each other? And you're probably gonna be okay. But if you see a big blip one way or the other, uh, it should be investigated. And that will impact a fraud engagement that you're working on that will also impact the, the business valuation because those numbers are probably uh, not gonna be correct. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to give me a call. I'll be more than glad to talk to you or you can send me an email. Either one is fine. I wanna thank you for, for uh, listening to this particular podcast today. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe to Richard Claywell or at Richard Claywell on LinkedIn and uh, at Litigation Speaks on YouTube. We have a multiple series of these that cover different topic areas that you may find of interest to be beneficial uh, in your practice uh, from evaluation and from a forensic or fraud standpoint. Thank you again. Appreciate your time.